Okay, so I think we'll go ahead and kick it off um, just while we wait. I know some people will kind of join in later. Uh, my name is Mercedes Elias. I'm one of the members of the Veterans Advisory Board for New York City. Um, I will be presenting for Todd Haskins, who's the chairman of the board. He did get called into some meetings, so he will be joining us a little bit later. Um, but I wanted to start off today's meeting just uh, giving a thank you to one of our members, Annette Tucker Osborne, who has served on the Veterans Advisory Board for a number of years. Um, she will be leaving us as she moves to Florida, and we wish her obviously fair winds and following seas. Uh, but we are welcoming a new member, Andrew Walcott, who is an Air Force veteran representing Brooklyn. He's both a CPA and a restaurant owner, and he will be joining as a mayoral appointee. Um, today's session is going to be a little bit different because the Department of Veterans Services would be presenting second. Um, I wanted to welcome and thank Ben Jamin Pomerantz, who is the Deputy Director for Program Development for New York State Department of Veterans Services, and he's going to be sharing some of the programs that the state is investing in and themes that they're seeing um, from the state level. And just to give you a little bit of background on, on Benjamin, um, he is the Deputy General Counsel for the agency, as well as working with the agency's, as the agency's legislative liaison. He supervises all of the division's training work, uh, running the agency's appellate advocacy unit, and oversees several of the division's programming initiatives. Uh, so thank you, Benjamin, for joining us today, and I will go ahead and turn it over to you. All right, good evening, everyone. It's nice to be here. I guess uh, I qualify as something different, which is great. Um, thanks for having me tonight, in all seriousness. Uh, thanks for taking your time on a snowy evening to uh, take part in this conversation. I'll rattle on for a little while about different things that I'm involved with up here at the state level and different programs that are going on, different trends that we're seeing. Uh, but I'm, I'm interested also in hearing from you and hearing thoughts that you have, ideas that you have, issues that you've encountered. I will tell you up front, there's probably things that I cannot solve tonight, right? I, I can't just wave a magic wand and solve them, but I want to hear about them. And I want to take them back and see what we can do with them. You know, and I, I, I always say that one of the good examples of this is that a long, long time ago, back when I began with the agency back in 2013, I was leading a program kind of like this. I wanted it to be as conversational as possible. And there were some folks there from a couple of New York's law schools who wanted to become more involved with veteran services work. And they said, you know, why is that that there's no funding that seems to be available for law schools who want to serve veterans and their families? Well, three years after that fact, we got to the point of having the New York State Justice for Heroes grant, which does provide funding of 50 grand a year for five law schools, 50 grand apiece to each of, each of five law schools in the state to provide services meeting veterans' unmet legal needs. So that's an example of a lot of times things cannot be solved in one evening. I'm not going to pretend they can, but I do take comments, suggestions, ideas, and so on quite seriously, take them back to our folks up in Albany, and eventually we get them done. Might be three days, might be three years, but we get them done. So our agency is 75 years old. I'm not 75 years old. Our, our agency is. Uh, we had all these plans for our 75th anniversary this year that uh, COVID-19 had some things to say about, and so some of them didn't take place as we were expecting. But I'm going to talk a lot tonight about silver linings because obviously COVID-19 is the elephant in the room for all of us, the tragedy of COVID-19, but out of crisis comes innovation sometimes, opportunity to do better sometimes. And I think there are certain things that we are doing better now as an agency and certain things that the veteran services community in New York State is doing better overall, really as a, a consequence of necessity imposed by COVID-19. Case in point, the ability to serve veterans and their families remotely. For a long time, the veteran services business, if you will, has been based a lot on person-to-person -person contact. Right? You have an office, a brick and mortar office, veteran walks in or family walks in and you have a conversation over the table and you pass papers back and forth and you file papers somehow with the Department of Veterans Affairs for benefits. And that kind of interaction was certainly our bread and butter. I think it was the bread and butter of the veteran services community overall around the state and around this country. What COVID-19 forced us to do was leave our offices because 
We couldn't be in a lot of them socially distanced. And a lot of them were in buildings that just simply shut down when COVID-19 happened. Add to that the fact that the VA, the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs, closed their regional offices, both in New York City, as probably you all know, and in Buffalo in, uh, in March, again, because of COVID-19. So it begged the question, what do we do? What we were able to do was work with a technology company out of Virginia called Tyler Technologies. A couple of years ago, I had worked with them and helped negotiate a contract with them to create a new electronic case management software for our agency, which we call VetOps. That w became the groundwork for what happened this year when COVID-19 forced us into a remote environment. We were able to work with them and with the IT folks for the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs to embed an electronic interface into VetOps, which now allows us from anywhere, from our home, from literally any place, to access the system, build an entire claims package, file that claims package with the VA by dropping it into their virtual desktop through this electronic interface, and get a date-stamped, time-stamped receipt back from the VA verifying the date of claim. That's something we couldn't do until this year. And it happened because COVID-19 forced us to make it happen. It forced people in the technology realm to work fast and work creatively. It forced government to find funds to allow us to keep the lights on and keep serving veterans and their families during these difficult times. And it's an innovation yeah, that I'm no. proud of in the Division of Veterans Services because now we have this ability wherever we are, in our home, in, in our office, wherever. And the veteran can be wherever, in their home or in a relative's home or wherever they happen to be. And we now have that ability to serve them remotely better than ever before. We also have the ability to train remotely better than ever before. One of the things that is kind of still a, a new focus of my work with the division is last year, last, uh, I think it was last July, I was asked to take the reins of the agency's learning team, our training units. And one of my focal points from the outset was our training is not just internal to our agency. Our training is for anyone and everyone who was engaged with serving veterans and their families. Because just, just teaching to ourselves, yeah, it helps us get better and it helps us have continuing education experiences, but we are all part of a broader network, state, city, local, not profit, all those different component parts are all part of, of what we do, what we need to do, and the interactions that we need to have. So this year, when COVID-19 happened, obviously we had these great plans for trainings. Uh, those could not happen in person anymore, but we were able to acquire the GoToWebinar platform license that we then used to develop a whole series of online trainings. And we rolled those those trainings out. We had two large scale week long trainings, uh, one of which even included presentations from the chief judge of the U.S. Court of Appeals for Veterans Claims, Margaret Bartley, and from Cheryl Mason, the chairman of the Board of Veterans Appeals, as well as many other leading lawyers and other advocates in the veteran spectrum. And these were the first trainings that we have had beginning last September, which was the first training that I led in this role and then our two large-scale online trainings this year became the first trainings that our agency has had really in, in a long time, if not the first ever, that were opened up not just to state folks, but folks from county veteran service agencies, folks from the New York City Department of Veterans Services, people who are in the veterans advocacy space overall. Continuing on that theme, COVID-19 also gave us the opportunity to collaborate more with our partners in county and city government. So you're the New York City CVEB, so that we'll be most interested in hearing about our New York City partnerships. This year, New York City Department of Veteran Services launched their first ever claims unit. And we had the privilege and the honor of working with them to train up that unit, to get their employees in that unit accredited by the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs for the preparation, presentation, and prosecution of claims and appeals, and then to work with them in a continuous education fashion 
to make certain that, you know, we're checking in with them, they're checking in with us, constant evaluation, constant feedback to make their unit as best as they can be. That unit's up and running now. That unit became a thing. It became an, an existing entity and stood on its own two feet and walked in the middle of this pandemic. And that, I think, is a real tribute to the devotion of New York City DBS and also to the work of my colleagues on the, the New York State Division's learning team to make that happen. We had a whole slew of, of trainings this year in addition to those two large-scale week-long trainings, again, entirely held online, again, open to anybody in the veterans advocacy space, basically, who wanted to join and receive that training and interact with the speakers, learn from the speakers. And we also were able to engage in a lot of individualized accreditation trainings, kind of like we did with New York City DVS, with several county veteran service agencies all across the state. It was interesting how, how some of that happened. The part that was interesting was, I guess sometimes when, when somebody offers something, there's always the question of, okay, here comes the government again offering something to us. What's the catch? Uh, one of the offers that, that we made was we wanted to make certain that, especially during COVID-19, when we knew that access was being restricted, when we knew that there were a lot of limitations going on, that we were able to reach out to as many people as we could to get them access to as many things as we could. What that meant was all the trainings that we do, free of charge, obviously, access for those accredited under our POA to our VetOps system, free of charge. We bought new concurrent user licenses at the beginning of the pandemic to make certain we could spread the wealth of access to that system. Access to a Department of Defense system called DPRIS, D-P-R-I-S, which is extraordinarily useful in tracking down uh, DD-214s, but also the entire OMPFs for veterans recently discharged. We're talking basically mid to late 1990s, depending on branch of service, through the present day. The one exception, for whatever reason, is the Coast Guard. Uh, the Coast Guard records have not been digitized yet. If there's any Coast Guard veterans uh, on the webinar tonight, uh, go, go yell at somebody about that. I, I'm not sure why the Coast Guard records aren't there. But be that as it may, uh, for the other four branches, uh, mid-1990s through the present day, those records are there, easily obtainable. County and city agencies, for whatever reason, DOD policy, can't get access to that system by themselves. But they can get access if a state agency or a state entity like us accredits them and vouches for their good character, reputation, and so on. And so that's another piece of access we've been able to offer. Um, th there was some suspicion when we began offering all this that there was something in it for the state as far as trying to poach business away from other places or trying to find some way to put other veteran service organizations out of business. Believe me, I, I'm being absolutely sincere when I tell you there was nothing that could have been further from our mind. The objective was collaboration and remain so. It was not meant to be, nor will ever be, any kind of hostile government takeover of the existing veteran service organizations in the state. The goal is to be a force multiplier and to work with as many people as we can, not to try and poach things away from anybody in any way, shape, or form. In that regard, in August of this year, we signed a agreement with the American Legion Department of New York, which again is, is a exciting thing for us to have something actually down on paper establishing our partnership with them focusing on the exact things I was telling you about, this exchange of training tools and technology, doing the work that we do, because it really is the same mission across the board and doing it better together. It's a cliche, I know, but it's a cliche for a reason. It's been around, that, that phrase has been around for a long time because it absolutely is true, and especially during these times of COVID-19 when needs are immediate, needs are urgent, and needs are more essential than ever, any chance that we can have to build those types of collaborative bridges, we're interested in, in doing that in any way that we can. One other thing that COVID-19 brought to us was a renewed focus on addressing food insecurity. Uh, veterans face food insecurity 
at higher rates than the general population. Among post-9-11 veterans, for example, when you compare them to their, their typical age group counterparts in the general population, post-9-11 veterans face food insecurity at twice the rate of the general population. This issue often flies below the radar uh, because of the misconceptions that I'm sure all of you have heard time and time again, that every veteran who comes back automatically is taken care of for life somehow by the government. Uh, of course, we know that that's a little bit more complex than that when someone comes back home from service. And what we were able to do because of the needs that COVID-19 exacerbated is really stand up a program focusing on addressing food insecurity. Two major locations for that, Western New York being one, the other being New York City, in which we have established a collaboration with some fantastic partners, New York City DVS being one, Black Veterans for Social Justice being another, the Campaign Against Hunger being a third. And week over week, since the beginning of July in New York City, we have been able, because of these partners, to have food delivered to the Campaign Against Hunger headquarters in a, a contract, basically, established between New York State and the Hello Fresh Meal Kit Corporation over in New Jersey. Truck comes in from Newark, drops off the food at the Campaign Against Hunger, and then veteran volunteers. That's truly a veteran helping veterans helping veterans model. Veteran volunteers then unpack the truck, assemble the food into meal kits in accordance with the Hello Fresh specifications, and get the meals out to veterans and their families who are facing uh, food insecurity. And we have had several partners in that distribution realm to include the New York City Veterans Alliance, to include a number of different American Legion posts and VFW posts in New York City, to include the VA itself with veterans whom they have identified as being food insecure, to make certain that we can play a role in addressing this elemental need of getting food on the table for those who have served this country. Uh, in Brooklyn alone, the, the Brooklyn arm of this program, Today, we hit 196,000 meals distributed to veterans and their families identified as being food insecure since this program began in July. And we, we have comparable numbers over in the western New York arm of this program, uh, hitting the Buffalo area, but also some of the more rural areas in Genesee County and Niagara County, Chautauqua County, and so on. One last thing, and then I'll, I'll stop, and, and I'll be happy to answer any questions about any of this stuff or anything else that you want to talk about tonight. And that is the work of something which is known as the Governor's Challenge. The Governor's Challenge is a nationwide program uh, partnering the Department of Veterans Affairs and the federal level with SAMHSA to coordinate statewide responses focusing on preventing suicide among veterans and their families. We've all seen the statistics around this topic, I'm not going to waste your time tonight reiterating them, uh, but we, we, you know, we know the challenge exists. We know also how COVID-19 has exacerbated this challenge as well. The week before things began shutting down in March, New York State joined the Governor's Challenge, and we had our first New York State delegation team meeting up in Albany. It was literally the last in-person meeting that I have been in this year. And it led to a, an extraordinary year of, of collaborations among the people who are on this team, uh, who include a number of people who are probably well known to you in New York City, such as Dr. Joe Geraci over at the Bronx VA Medical Center, uh, who's spearheading this great ETS sponsorship program that we're working with, um, Commissioner Hendon and Ellen Greeley from New York City DVS are, are, part, of, are part of this team. So, the objective of, of this is to find a way for these various stakeholders, again, on this collaboration theme, to partner together and to be force multipliers in the area of suicide prevention. For example, I mentioned Joe Geraci and the ETS sponsorship program, which is the new effort for individuals who opt in before date of discharge to say, hey, I'm coming home to New York. I opt into this program because I want to be connected with someone in my home area who is a trained peer mentor slash peer guide. So that way, when I leave, when I walk out of the gates of military service on my last day, 
I'm able to go back home and know that there's at least one person waiting there who knows I'm coming back and who can walk that road along with me. So we've connected ETS sponsorship with individuals in the state who are leaders in the Joseph P. Dwyer peer-to-peer program. Okay, these are two entities, both in peer services, who had not really intertwined before. Now we have pilot programs springing up in the state, which are focusing on the collaboration between ETS and Dwyer with the goal of making both sides better. Also probably known to to you in New York City are Dr. Kelly Posner and Dr. Keita Franklin from Columbia, who have established what's known as the Columbia Protocol. And on Veterans Day of this year, we signed into an agreement with them focusing on integration of the Columbia Protocol in the veteran services arena. Columbia Protocol is nice as a gatekeeper suicide prevention tool because it gets away from some of the, I don't know, I guess some of the, 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 the language or some of the, the, the clinical stuff that can sometimes intimidate people about engaging in the work of suicide prevention. What the Columbia Protocol focuses on and has been rigorously peer-reviewed to be quite successful in is using just conversations, people speaking to other people to address the issue of suicide prevention wherever those people happen to be. And what the Columbia Protocol uses are certain conversationally based questions, which depending on the responses, correspond to certain scores. That's the actual Columbia scale. And the score on that Columbia scale is a determinative factor of, is this a person who is in potentially a crisis situation, a person where clinical mental health assistance or intervention would be valuable and potentially life-saving. And so our objective with the Columbia Protocol, folks, is on two levels. One, of course, making certain that it gets integrated into the veteran services arena for those who work as veteran service officers, as veterans law attorneys, and so on, to use this with their clients as a suicide prevention tool on the gatekeeper level. But secondly, secondly in number, not secondly in importance, is the veteran services community being able to use the Columbia Protocol with one another. I imagine that it's not foreign to you, uh, the fact that many people who enter the veteran services realm ultimately leave that realm because of the daily recurring stresses of what people have to do. Veteran service officers, for example, spend a lot of time looking at military documents, hearing stories about other veterans' military experiences, sometimes looking at pictures from in-service, sometimes reading letters that were written in-service, all these different things that can remind those veteran service officers about perhaps potentially traumatizing aspects of their own service and calling that back. And sometimes it calls it back on a recurrent basis. And one thing that I've noticed over my past seven plus years doing this is that in the advocacy community, and I'm as guilty of this as anybody, we get so tunnel visioned in making certain that we are there present every day as advocates for others that we often forget or are unable to look inwardly to ourselves and say, hey, how is my mental health status doing? Where where am I on this spectrum? And so the hope is that by integrating the Columbia Protocol around the state in the veteran services community, it'll be used not just with clients, but with one another do these conversations to make certain that we are doing the proverbial buddy checks with each other and looking out for our fellow veterans advocates. It's always the, uh, the looming question, right? Who cares for the caregiver? We have that obligation of caring for one another. So I've rattled on for a while there. I'm happy to stop now and take some questions. If no one has questions, I always have more things to say as well, but I'll, I'll pause there for a second. Anything specific anybody wants to talk about in the uh, the veteran services realm that I can uh, hopefully address or at least take back for further review? Uh, 
Hey, Benjamin, this is James Fitzgerald. Can you hear me? Hey, James, how's it going? It's, it's going well. Uh, thank you for you know coming tonight. Thank you for speaking. Uh, one, one of the questions I have is relatively broad, but I'd love to hear your input. Um, are there any emerging trends that you're seeing this year that you haven't seen in years prior? There are. One trend that we're seeing this year that I have not seen in years prior, and perhaps it's because we're paying more attention to it this year, or perhaps it's because the trend has gone this way this year, is uh, in the VA healthcare realm. Uh, we're unfortunately seeing more issues be than ever before when it comes to individuals who are eligible for certain aspects of VA healthcare not being granted entry to those aspects. So for example, maybe a little more specific than that. There's a law out there called the Honor Our Commitment Act. If you wanna read the, the, the actual text, it's Title 38, Section 1720I of the United States Code. What this refers to is if a veteran is someone who had served in combat or operated drones from a stateside position, but those drones are being operated over in a combat situation, or if that veteran is a survivor of military sexual trauma, that veteran, as long as they have some level of administrative discharge, even a other than honorable conditions discharge, is able to go to a VA medical facility and receive from that facility mental health care and behavioral health care, okay? OTH discharge notwithstanding. We are seeing a lot of situations of veterans who meet that Honor Our Commitment Act profile not being granted the medical care. And again, we're talking specifically here about mental health care and behavioral health care that they are eligible for under the text of the law. I mean, the, the law is right there. Uh, there, in fact, was a VHA network director, not in New York City, to be specific, not in New York City, but still in New York State, who told me uh, about a month or so ago that the Honor Argument Act was not a law. He said, well, no, that, that was never passed. And then when I provided that person the citation to the law, they came back with, well, this veteran applied for disability compensation before and was denied because of their OTH discharge, which doesn't matter. It's just simply that that's not part of the equation. You can look at the law all day. There's nothing in there saying if a person was denied years ago for that benefit, for disability compensation, that they can't get the mental health care or behavioral health care that they are eligible for under, the, under this particular law. Uh, ironically enough, a year ago, Several members of the U.S. Senate sent a letter to VA Secretary Wilkie in which they said, you know, we passed this law a year ago and you're not following it and you need to follow it. You need to make sure your facilities are granting admission to these eligible veterans for mental health care and behavioral health care. Well, now another year has gone by and there certainly have been situations where that is not being followed still in our own state. So that's concerning. We, we've seen also issues on the VHA front of the VA's Mission Act provisions not being followed, where individuals meet the criteria of a certain type of treatment not being available to them at a VA facility. They're looking for private sector care. The VA says, no, we have something here that is more or less adequate to meet that medical need. Well, that's not what the VA Mission Act says, right? The, the, the VA's whole premise has long been, we want to be the best, which makes perfect sense. We want to be the best in healthcare. And so if there is a better treatment out there that we don't, we don't have available to you, uh, and you can show that there is a approved provider in our network that gives that treatment, the VA Mission Act, at least as I read it, is supposed to cover that. And we've had more battles around those types of topics recently than we have in the past. Again, it could be because we're in a time period now where healthcare and the need for healthcare has come to the forefront even more than it has in past years because of COVID-19 and the attention around it. Or it could be because the problem might be, I don't know, getting worse in some way. Uh, either way, we're certainly seeing more of those issues than we have in the past. Uh, so definitely a thing to keep an eye on and to, uh, to advocate for on behalf of veterans around New York City and elsewhere.
Something else, which is new this year, which I think is leading us in a good direction, is New York State has a new law on the books, which is called the Restoration of Honor Act. It was signed into law a year ago by the governor, but it didn't go into effect until 12 November 2020. This law, again, refers to veterans who have administrative discharges that are lower on the spectrum than honorable. And what it says is if that less than honorable admin discharge was issued because of that veteran's service-related mental health condition, so specifically talking about PTSD or a traumatic brain injury, or if it was related to that veteran's military sexual trauma that they experienced in service, or if that was the result of the military's policies or actions concerning that veteran's sexual orientation or gender identity or gender expression. The Restoration of Honor Act now provides a pathway for New York State to open up the doors of more than 50 state benefits that are premised eligibility-wise and having a under honorable conditions discharge. And if on the state's review, it's proven that the applicant is a match for the, uh, the, the criteria of the Restoration of Honor Act, our division now has authority to issue a letter on our letterhead saying, this is somebody who served under conditions that New York State deems to be sufficiently honorable for getting access to these 50 plus state benefits. And that letter now serves as a document they can bring into those different state agencies in lieu of their DD-214 and present that to the tax and finance office or present that to the Department of Motor Vehicles or present that to whatever place is the place in question offering the benefit or the service that they're looking for. But what this has led to, in addition to being able to grant this access to these veterans who for, for many of them, it's been not only years, but decades of, of living with this, this really unjustly issued discharge character. It also has led to the development of new cases on the federal level that we are advocating for, for those same veterans, using by and large the same evidence that they presented to us in their Restoration of Honor Act application. You know, it's often overlooked, but a veteran who has a less than honorable discharge is not automatically barred from being able to access things like disability compensation from the VA or non-service connected pension from the VA. There are pathways for, for a veteran to be able to access those benefits, even with, for example, an OTH discharge. In some situations, even with a bad conduct discharge based on certain provisions of federal law. And I'm happy to talk about that longer if you'd like. Uh, but the bottom line, as far as the trends are concerned, we're bringing more of those cases forward because the Restoration of Honor Act has really inspired more of these veterans to bring their cases forward to us and say, hey, yeah, I've lived with this for some time now, but I do feel I was wrongly given this less than honorable discharge, and here's why. Right Here's the situation around my mental health, or here's the situation around the military's discrimination or animus toward me based on my sexual orientation or based on my gender identity or expression. So we're, we're handling more of those cases. I, I do think it is in many ways a function of the Restoration of Honor Act bringing those cases forward to us. So a couple of trends there that we've noticed. Uh, thank you so much. Um, like the the only follow on question I would have would be legal services attached to the Restoration of Honor Act uh, with the abundance of new cases coming up. Uh, is there an abundance of new legal resources that are going to be available to veterans uh, that need that support uh, as they go through this process? There is. We have a collaboration now with another partner that's that's a they've been a partner with us in the past, but this particular partnership is new this year. The New York State Bar Association. Uh, has a, a veterans committee on which I'm privileged to sit. And they had this idea of we want to do something with regard to the Restoration of Honor Act. And so in collaboration with our division, uh, they have a program now where attorneys are able to receive a couple of free continuing legal education credits in exchange for represent, going to a training call, and then secondly represent a veteran in an application 
for the restoration of Honor Act consideration by the state, which is wonderful because what that does now is instead of the veteran going out and trying to put an application together on their own, they now are able to work with that attorney free of charge through this New York State Bar Association program. And the attorney works with them to prepare that application and to support, making it a really a better and more complete application, thus making it easier for us to decide it in the veteran state. Already we have had 18 attorneys uh, sign on to this brand new program to volunteer, and I imagine that more will be coming in the future as it continues to take off. Thank you, Benjamin. No problem, James. Nice to hear from you. Benjamin, it's been great to hear about the work that you've been doing over the past year, obviously, with the case management software and the training and the governor's challenge and things like that. Can you just let us know what are the top priorities for state DVS uh, going into 2021? Sure. So a couple of things are continuations of things that we're already doing, right? We're, we're working now with, with more county-level veteran service agencies than ever before. We want to continue that. We want to grow on that. Okay. We, we want to make certain that we are reaching out truly across the state at all levels of government, local government, city government, county government, whatever it is, to provide opportunities where they can be trained by us, they can be accredited by us, they can get access to technology like our VetOps system, like the deeper system, all that free of charge, okay? And importantly, all of that with no adverse impact in any way, shape, or form on any other accreditation that they may have. So it's fine to have VFW accreditation and state accreditation side by side. It's fine to have Regional accreditation, the state accreditation side by side. There's no barriers. There's no quotas of how many claims you have to do under each POA. Our goal is to make certain that all these different groups, all these different entities that are advocating on behalf of veterans, know that we're there, number one. Secondly, know that we are there as a resource for them in these areas of training tools and technology. And then thirdly, that they realize that. We're there as a trusted resource. There's no hiding the ball going on. There's no desire for the Division of Veteran Services to take people away from any other veteran service. And we want to work in consort with them, not in any kind of opposition with them. Also, another push for us, and this comes out of the governor's challenge work very much, is to increase our ability to work with various sectors in the military cultural competency realm. What does that mean exactly? What that means is making certain that people in more walks of life and in more professions and in more public interactions are, number one, asking the question of people, have you ever served in the military? Making certain that question is being asked as part of the intake process. And then secondly, making certain that they have some sense of what to, to look for and what to do when a person says, yes, in fact, I have. So, for example, tomorrow we're going to be signing a new partnership between our agency, the State Bar Association, and a group called Psych Armor, which provides asynchronous online learning opportunities that are focused on military cultural competency. They are building, free of charge to the state, free of charge to the New York State Bar, a veteran-ready attorney training curriculum. That's going to be rolled out starting in the beginning of 2021. Attorneys will be able to, at their convenience, whenever they want, uh, complete the courses in that curriculum and receive veteran-ready attorney digital badging for doing so that they are then able to use on their social media platform if they're advertising all those, all those good aspects that are, are always quite important to them. I was talking just yesterday with folks out at Stony Brook in the School of Social Work about putting together a series at the beginning of 2021, focusing on training for current and future social workers, about working with veterans on the military cultural competency front, also some, some top line knowledge around veterans benefits, veteran services. That way, if they're working with a client who has served in the military, they have a better sense of what that client could be eligible for, where to refer that client for additional services, all those different aspects to build those connections. 
It goes even as far as contact tracers, right? In our, our world of COVID-19, contact tracing is a huge area of, of focus right now as far as people who interact with the public. We are putting a training together for contact tracers because we found out that in the contact tracing work, the question of have you ever served in the military was not being asked. And so people were reporting back, you know, we're working with, with individuals who lack access to health insurance, who lack access to health care, who are struggling financially. Well, okay, are you asking, have you served? Because if they say yes, that could potentially open up pathways to VA health care or benefits like disability compensation or pension that could help out financially and on and on and on and on to there, as you all know. So we're going to be doing a training for, for the contact tracers to make certain that they know about veterans resources, about military cultural competency aspects, about overcoming certain stereotypes that uh, sometimes come out too often from, from Hollywood and other types of pop culture about who veterans are. And so those types of cultural competency trainings and top line overview trainings are essential. Uh, a lot of the governor's challenge work has talked about how do we make certain that veterans don't fall through the proverbial cracks of the system? Well, it's by asking the question. And then when the answer is yes, having people who might not be spending day in and day out working in the veteran services arena, still knowing enough to know what other questions to ask, what other things to think about, and what other resources exist that can be a, a good resource, a good, good warm handoff, if you will, uh, for that veteran. So those are two things we want to continue in 2021. Definitely more work, a, a lot more work on the, uh, the virtual claims element. COVID-19 is not leaving us anytime soon. We want to keep getting more and more proficient on doing claims work virtually. We've kept the lights on the entire time during the pandemic. You know, our, our physical offices have closed, but like I mentioned at the outset, we have been doing claims, we've been doing appeals all the way through and making certain that those those cases are getting downrange the VA as fast as possible and as thoroughly as possible. We want to keep doing that, obviously. And then the restoration of honor act, right? So far, we've had good success with that. We want to keep building on that success and making certain that it becomes better known throughout the veterans community in New York State that just because you have something other than the word honorable printed on your discharge paperwork, that does not mean the conversation always has to end there, right? Certain times, yeah, it will because of the reasons around the discharge. But plenty of other times, that conversation stops as soon as somebody hears, oh, OTH discharge, oh, can't help you. And that's something that we are deeply committed to working on and making certain it stops. Uh, too often, I get telephone calls from people saying, well, I'm talking to this person who served in the military, but I don't think I can really do anything for them. Well, why not? Well, they have an OTH discharge. Okay. What were the circumstances surrounding that discharge? I have no idea. And so when that happens, the person who says no without finding out any further details has just shut down a possible lifeline, really, for, for that particular veteran. So those are a few of the, uh, the many priorities that we have for, for 2021, uh, many of which build on the work that we've done in 2020. That's great. Thank you for that. No problem. Are there any particular topics or, or, or issues, especially any issues that you are seeing in New York City that uh, you feel are flying below the radar or not being addressed thoroughly enough in your estimation? Yeah, this is Paul Dietrich. It's something I've seen a couple of times recently, particularly this year, it seems. Uh, when they're evaluating claims, this is the VA again. I realize this is a federal issue, but they're going mostly to contract. And one of the issues, I, I have a, a veteran in one of my uh, posts, the handicapped veteran, he barely can get around. He uses a walker and they wanted to send them to Westchester County from Staten Island for a hearing evaluation. 
for a hearing claim. I mean, it's just re- ridiculous that they would expect them to travel that long to get a hearing evaluation claim case. And the other part of that is that if you choose not to do that, they are sometimes counting that as one of your two evaluation chances. They only give you two before they can basically put the claim on hold. So this is a big issue. Transportation in New York City was a nightmare before COVID, and it's worse of a nightmare now. So this is, to me, an issue that needs to be looked at again with the feds. Maybe there's some cooperative uh, way that we could do this, but to expect somebody to go to Westchester County for a hearing exam is ridiculous. Yeah, this is an issue that we are seeing with our benefits advisors across the state. Uh, and, and you're right, it is ridiculous. Uh, the, the most ridiculous one that, uh, that I recall from recent memory uh, it is a 92-year-old Korean War veteran from central New York who they wanted to have travel basically halfway across the state to get a comp and pen exam. This was just before COVID-19 happened. Then, of course, you have the other issue that COVID-19 has caused of comp and pen exams being canceled by the VA. And as a recent VA IG report noted, uh, there have been, unfortunately, cases where the VA has then gone and denied the claim, saying, well, you didn't get a comp and pen exam. Well, of course I didn't, because you canceled the exam because all the in-person exams in, I think it was April 3rd of this year, were, were put on hold or some canceled entirely. A couple of notes on that. One is the fact that it, it, you're, you're probably going to already, which is kind of a, a practice note, is that when I have a, a veteran with whom I'm working who's in the situations that we're talking about here where transportation is just not going to be happening, um, I always file a, a VA form 21-4138 with it saying, with regard to any comp and pen exam scheduled for this veteran, Here's the situation. There's transportation barriers, there's mobility difficulties, there's advanced age, there's whatever. Please do not schedule this veteran for an exam at any location outside of this geographic radius. And then if they come back and try and do that, immediately uh, going and objecting to that and saying, no, you were put on notice through that Form 4138 narrative saying that this veteran could not attend an exam outside of this area. It's an undue burden on the veteran to impose that on this on this individual. You need to reschedule the exam. The VA, as a proclaimant system, is supposed to supposed to do that in that type of situation. We've had plenty of back and forth traffic with them on that, but ultimately, I would say overall, in most cases, they have been good about finally scheduling the comp and pen exam in a a place or in a manner that is that is appropriate for that veteran's mobility restrictions. Second thing on that is something called acceptable clinical evidence, which has become more important than ever during COVID-19. Within the uh, the VA's own internal operating guidelines, the M21-1 manual, there's a whole section talking about acceptable clinical evidence that can be accepted as the basis for rating a claim in lieu of a comp and pen exam. Right? Not every single case for disability compensation has to go to a comp and pen exam. And in fact, when you go and start looking through the, the language of the M21-1, it specifies that uh, the VA is, in fact, encouraged to, uh, to use acceptable clinical evidence in lieu of a comp and pen exam when it's appropriate to do so, and even strongly encouraged in any situation where, for example, the veteran is dealing with a terminal illness and time is of the essence, or any situation where the veteran is dealing with a claim for hearing loss or tinnitus, where they can basically look at the numbers from the audiology reports and say, okay, yeah, this person meets the criteria for a rating for this condition. Um, And and they go through this whole set of language in the M21-1 about why this type of evidence is encouraged, not just allowed, but encouraged in lieu of comp and pen exams and it's only disallowed. It's only disallowed in certain very specific situations. And so one thing we've been doing a lot of during COVID-19 time with comp and pen exams becoming not happening in person, number one, 
Number two, some challenges take place for people, particularly in remote areas, when it comes to the the um, the tele exam uh, online hookups. We have been advocating whenever possible for the veteran to have their claim reviewed and rated by the VA on the basis of acceptable clinical evidence. And when we do that, we actually put in the Form 4138 the exact language from the M21-1 where it says the VA is encouraged to do this. They don't always do it, but it is a helpful way of getting to that point. Mike, I think you're on mute. Mike, we're not, we're not able to hear you. If you want to go ahead and put the question over in the chat box, Mike, that could work as well. I, I'm not picking up your audio. And while Mike's doing that, I'm, I'm going to put over in the chat box right now my contact information, just so you all have that. And if I did that correctly, hopefully everyone has that uh, that name and email now sent out to everyone on the on the webinar here. Yep, we can see that. And I just wanted to ask for any last um, questions for Benjamin. There's got to be at least one more out there somewhere. Well, I want to thank you, Benjamin, uh, just for attending. You gave a really comprehensive overview of all the work that uh, DBS at the New York State level is doing, and we really appreciate that insight um, from you. So, again, thank you for, for joining us and, and contributing so much. Um, at this time, I think that we do want to turn it over to the New York City Department of Veterans Services just to give us a few updates on the initiatives that they have been working on. Do we have Kwame or the commissioner um, or anybody else from the DVS side? They must be out shoveling. <laughs> Unless they're not sure that they're on mute. Good evening. Yes. Yes, I'm, I'm not on my laptop. Is it possible I might be able to get that information, so, um, Benjamin's information, contact information, please? I, I can I can read it out loud if you want, uh, and you can, you, can, you can copy it down. Uh, yes. Email address is Benjamin, B-E-N-J-A-M-I-N. -N. Thank you. Uh, Pomerantz. P O M E R A N C E. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Say the, say the last name again. The last name is Pomerantz. P as in Peter. O M E R A N C E. Thank you. At. Okay. Veterans. 
V E T E R A N S. Okay. Dot N Y. Okay. Dot G O V. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. Thank you very much. And this is uh, attorney at law, right? Yes. Thank you so much. Guilty as charged. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, thank you so much. Oh. Yes, we can hear you. Oh, good. Hi, this is John Rowan. Sorry I got on this thing so late that I was on a conference call with all the other big six VSOs uh, with the new uh, secretary designate there before we got you guys got started. But I've been listening to this gentleman's uh, conversation there. Mr. Pomerantz, are you with the state? Is that what I was reading by your, your email? Yes, you I am. The state Division of Veterans Affairs? or? Yep, yeah, Veterans Services uh, for the past uh, seven plus years. Oh, very cool. Very good. Okay, yeah, because I was, I was very interested in what you had to say, and I'm very interested in this new law that somehow gives people some rights. But um, I guess still doesn't affect all the federal stuff, which is the key. That's stuff. right. Yeah, because it's a state statute, so the limit of its authority is granting access for state benefits. Uh, we we have no authority to tell the feds what to do, even though sometimes we'd like to do so. Uh, however, like I mentioned before, what this has also done is it's opened up some good pathways for advocacy at the federal level, where. The same evidence that comes into play for a Restoration of Honor Act case uh, then goes forward for getting access to VA health care or getting access to VA disability compensation or pension or getting access even down the line for a discharge upgrade from the Department of Defense, depending on the type of case that we're dealing with. Uh, so even though we can't control what the feds do, we certainly can and do advocate for veterans on the federal level. And so often the Restoration of Honor Act becomes a step one, with step two being further pursuit of other federal benefits and services. Yeah, I, I worked on the Veterans Up Upgrade Center back in the day when we were alive in the 70s before we got killed. Uh, and we were doing discharge upgrading for several years and it was really good. Um, and I'm always interested in this thing. Could you send me some information? My email is real simple. It's jrowan at vva.org. It's R-O-W-A-N. So it's J-R-O-W-A-N at vva.org. I'd be happy to. And actually, I, I definitely recall uh, being with you up in Albany when you were inducted right. into the Veterans Hall of Fame. So it's right. nice to hear you again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, when you can I, still I would travel. send you all the information that we have on that, the application form and the various but, benefits yeah. that it affects and all that good stuff. Some people I need to pass that on to besides just Wonderful. looking at it. All right, thanks. Sorry, yeah. Uh, sorry I got late, Commissioner, but you know, and Todd if he's on. But I'm here now. Thank you. So I have a question then, uh, ba based on what uh, what you were saying, Mr. Rowan, about your last meeting. Uh, wh what were the topics on the table with the new uh, secretary designee? What were you talking about? If you're allowed yeah, well, to reveal, we had a whole big hour, and there were six of us. So <laughs> uh, we we ran into a bunch of different things. Uh, we talked. To, um, my issue was the toxic exposure stuff uh, from Vietnam to the present day. Uh, not only in the overseas, but in the States as well. Um, there was a whole lot of people when they filed claims to 48 hour rule, which, which was the killing of that was the stupidest thing the VA has ever done. Um, well, we talked about a lot of other things. Um, uh, let's see if I can, the caregivers issue was brought up. The extension of that to cover all the post the pre 9/11 folks. Uh, the importance of diversity, uh, the vaccine, what's going on with that, with regards to veterans. Uh, a lot of discussion about mental health issues and suicide. A lot of concern about that. Uh, and so that's a pretty comprehensive hour. I'm sorry. That's a pretty comprehensive hour of conversation. 
That's great. Yeah, it wasn't bad. I mean, we uh, it was pretty good because the truth is the, the 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 six organizations were the usual suspects: you know, the Legion, VFW, DAV, MVETS, TVA, and me from Vietnam Veterans of America. And frankly, we were all pretty much in agreement on the issues. There was no, you know, we, people, you know, brought up different things as we went along when we each got a few minutes to chat. And uh, he seems very sincere and very interested in working with us. So that's a key. That's a plus. Certainly much more that's than lately. good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that, that's a good sign for some positive change, hopefully. All right, so I just got word from the uh, deputy commissioner that the New York City DVS isn't going to be on, so this is purely just for the state uh, DVS. So, Benjamin, if you have anything else, please let us know. Well, I'll, I'll toss a couple of more breadcrumbs on the water then. Uh, one, going off of what Mr. Rowan just talked about with the uh, Vietnam veterans' Agent Orange uh, exposure cases, uh, just to make certain we're all tracking right now, in the National Defense Authorization Act, one of the big pieces to that would be the addition of three new Agent Orange presumptive conditions. So Parkinson's-like symptoms, also called, called Parkinsonians, would be on the list. Hypothyroidism would be on the list. And really the biggest of the three, as far as numbers from what I can tell, would be bladder cancer would be going on to the presumptive list as well, under the language in the the NDAA. Where that stands right now on the federal side of the House is that both the House and the Senate have passed the act by wide margins. It now goes up before the president uh, to take action. Uh, the president has publicly talked about vetoing the NDAA, which would be kind of a surprising move, but he has certain things to which he apparently objects in the uh, the text of the, the bill. It seems to be a moving target each time he speaks about it. The, uh, the things to which he objects change every time. But I guess the, the good news that seems to be in existence is that even if the president were to veto the NDAA, the margins by which it passed in Congress were so substantial that if those margins hold, if the vetoed bill goes back to Congress, they could essentially override his veto. Again, if those margins of passage hold, they could override his veto and the NDAA, including those three new Agent Orange presumptives and the other provisions to include new uh, mental health care resources for rural areas and things like that, would then become law with full force and effect, despite the president's veto. So even with that veto possibility looming, it's not like a veto from the president means the end of the road for, for that bill and specifically in this context, uh, for the addition of those three new presumptive conditions. One other new thing on the state side of the House we didn't talk about yet that I think is good to mention because there's a New York connection, a New York City connection, is on Veterans Day this year, the governor signed into law the Outdoor Recreational Therapy Bill, which is going to focus on providing resources, opportunities, new pathways for veterans to be able to gain uh, opportunities for recreational therapy in the great outdoors. And that's often thought of as being, well, it's out in the Adirondacks and out in the Catskills, and it certainly is there, but it's also in New York City very much as well. In fact, one of the members of the working group that we have assembled, it's already had one meeting, we're, we're driving toward a second, uh, to create a report on this about where the state is now and where the state can reasonably go on this topic um, is a is a, a New York City resident uh, who works with the Sierra Club and who has been involved with leading outings in places like Central Park and other areas of, of nature in, in New York City. So this is something that might fly below the conventional New York City radar in that it's called outdoor recreational therapy, and it makes you think about places far beyond the city limits, but it absolutely has a New York City component to it, and uh, the city certainly has nature-based opportunities that could then be uh, utilized as a, a therapeutic opportunity for veterans and for their families. So that's brand new. It was just signed into law a month ago. And again, our first step has been to assemble the working group as required by law 
to generate this report. The report will come out six months from the date of the law's signing. So early in 2021, uh, be on the lookout for that report, and I can certainly send it your way if you'd like, when it comes out, talking about what the findings of that working group is on the outdoor recreational therapy front. Anything else? Any any comments or concerns that anybody has that uh, you feel have been boiling around in your mind for a while, or that you feel you've you've raised before and have not been addressed, or anything I can I can hopefully address or focus on before we conclude tonight? Let's see. It looks like there's one coming in the in the chat box, possibly. Oh, I'll wait a second for uh, for anyone who's putting anything in the chat box to finish up with uh, with typing. Benjamin, um, just going to relate to your comment before the Mission Act and referrals yes. outside of the VA. Have you um, noticed any more? Uh, of these issues being downstate or upstate uh, more? In other words, the city or out of the city? Um, is it like the New York Harbor Healthcare? You know, we know that there's issues there that they don't like to refer people out no matter what. So that's a, that's a great question. Um, one of the things that we're actually doing right now is we are we are conducting a a survey looking at the past couple of years of VHA issues. And we've been sending this this Google document out to advocates in the veteran space saying, over the course of the past two years, uh, have you yourself or have clients with whom you've worked encountered any issues with accessing VHA care? If so, what? You know, give us the details on it without, without divulging anybody's personal privacy, but but give us the overview so we know what the issues were and how it was or was not addressed. So I'll have a better answer for that question probably in about a month or so from now once we get those responses back and crunch the data. If anybody on this webinar, by the way, is interested in filling out uh, that form, send me an email, please, and I'll get it over to you right away because we want to have as many different people providing feedback as we possibly can uh, around this topic of VA healthcare. Anecdotally, I have not noticed myself a specific geographic trend of it's only happening out west or it's only happening up north or it's only happening in New York City. We're, we're seeing we're seeing dribs and drabs of it happening everywhere, frankly. Uh, it's not limited to one area, and it not happening is also not limited to one area. Uh, in, in some ways, it goes back to the old cliche around, well, when you've been to one VA, you've been to one VA. And it's kind of the same thing here. A lot of times it depends, it seems, on who the veteran interacts with at the admissions desk, for example, at a VA medical facility. Does that person fully comprehend the uh, the, the full scope of what veterans' health care eligibility looks like or, or not? Or, or do they have gaps in that knowledge or, or gaps in that understanding? So... I have not seen a specific geographic trend yet, but I'll be very interested in seeing when those comments come back on that Google Docs form and we start crunching that data if we start to see geographic trends develop. So a, a month or so from now, uh, definitely stay tuned. I had a question. I'll reach out to you, I'll, I'll reach out to you because I've, um, uh, I have people in, in Montrose and Castle Point who said, you know, they've been referring out, no problem. You know, everything goes smoothly. Uh, until recently, actually, they, they've tightened up a little more. But within New York Harbor, everything is so micromanaged that um, even if you do get the referral, it's difficult to work with it because of the people handling it. I'm not going to throw the names out right now. Um, within the harbor um, that run community care. So, um there's just been a lot of difficulty. Uh, I've seen more uh, downstate uh, in, in the harbor, um, you know, 
seem to go more toward penny pinching than anything else. I, I can tell you that right now, without going into any any confidence divulging details, that there are active cases on which we are working that do involve veterans in the New York Harbor system who are, are trying to get access to community care for some unique uh, medical needs. And there's been some challenges around that. So uh, I, I, I understand uh, I understand where you're coming from in saying that. Uh, just to draw your attention to the chat, uh, Marco posted a, a useful tool in there, the community care uh, locator that the, that the VA has, where they have that drop-down menu uh, of facility type for the community care providers. Good tool to use to see what's in your backyard as far as people who are in network within the VHA who are available to provide community care. Um, the, the VA certainly can do and and does do that that legwork, but it's always good, you know, knowledge is power to when you can do that kind of homework yourself. So when you're working with, you know, be it the VA or anybody else, you can come in and say, I know that there are the following providers in these areas of specialty within this geographic range, you know, and so that way there, it, it takes any conversation off the table immediately about, oh, there's no, there's no one around here that gives this type of care in the network. Uh, you, you've already done that legwork and, and brought that up. So that's it, a great tool. I'm yeah, glad that, with, uh, uh, that Marco highlighted. Yeah, no, that, that's a good tool because you can find the actual providers and so forth once you get an authorization. But the, they don't want to give the authorizations to and be able to go to those providers. So... And then the providers don't understand, you know, what um, that it was Tri West was its own um, entity as the intermediary third party, and now it's uh, Optum, I believe, um, that took over. So they don't know that they're still um, an authorized uh, community care provider to the VA that they're going through this third party now. So if you speak to these providers, they say, oh, no, I don't take up. Oh, no, we can't take TriWest. Well, you take you are through the VA. So that's what this, and the people with the VA aren't then um, uh, discussing it with those providers to let them know that it's a third party contracting agent. Right, yeah. Yeah, all valid points and, and good points. Uh, th there was also a question in the chat box regarding services uh, in, in 2021 focusing on women veterans. Another good accomplishment of 2020 for our agency was this was the, the first full calendar year of, of service with our agency for Kristen Rouse, who was our agency's deputy director for diversity, equity, and inclusion. And among the many hats that she wears in that role is serving as our agency's Women Veterans Coordinator. In fact, she'd, she'd be a, a very good speaker for a, a future uh, meeting with, with this particular body um, to talk about the work that she's doing. But one of the things that, that we're focusing on that's really come to our attention a lot and also is, is, is one that I think needs to have more attention uh, being being brought to it is the, the the matter of knowing on the VA level of uh, who precisely the women veterans coordinators are at the different VA medical facilities around the state every medical facility is supposed to have one and and they do but often these are people who in addition to that role have a number of other different hats that they wear and so one thing that is extremely important to us, and it's going to remain important to us, and, and, and getting the word out is going to be important to us, is identifying facility by facility who the Women Veterans Coordinator is at each of these facilities and makes making certain that women veterans around New York State get that information and they know who that person is, how to contact that individual, you know, and, and what the basic descriptions of that individual's job looks like. So that's definitely a thing to stay tuned for in 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 2021. Uh, earlier this year, uh, Kristen led a 
Very good. Chris had a program earlier this year which focused on women veterans, bringing in people from the VA side of the house as well as various other advocacy spaces. And I know she is looking to have more programs like that that are conversation-based, listening session-based in 2021. Um, hopefully, uh, hopefully at some point we can get back to doing that kind of stuff in person. But until that time, online work, uh, you know, it, it has its merits as well. On a snowy night, you can take part from wherever you are. So we certainly have the capacity to run those types of programs online, and we will continue to be doing so in the year ahead. Other questions that, uh, that anybody has or, or comments or concerns that you want to raise before we adjourn? Again, you all have my, my email, which is over in the chat box. And if you think of something, you know, tomorrow night or a week from now or a month from now, don't be shy about giving me a message and I'll be happy to address it as best I can. Yep. Thanks so much for attending, Benjamin, and for sharing that wealth of knowledge. It was definitely appreciated. Um, and if anybody needs Benjamin's contact information, it is in the chat. Um, we can also provide it for you if necessary. Um, again, Benjamin, thank you so much for your time. It is absolutely appreciated. Well, thank you to all of you for the work that we're doing. You know, the, the old cliche about all government being local is an old cliche for a reason. And uh, it's because it's true. And the work that you are doing boots on the ground in New York City is extraordinary work. You are the eyes and ears of the veterans community in the five boroughs. And we always appreciate any insights that you have, any observations that you have. So don't be shy about reaching out if you have things that you want to share with me and with my colleagues in the agency at any time for us to, to take back and, and build upon and hopefully do some good things with. So I'll, I'll leave you with that. Thanks for the work that you're doing. Uh, have a nice holiday. Stay safe and be well. And looking forward to being in touch. Thank Is you. Hope everybody has a safe night. First and last name. Hello. Is that you, John? Is there a dot between this first and last name, or is it just all one name? There's a dot. It's it's Benjamin dot Pomerantz at veterans dot ny dot gov. I'm sorry. Did you hear me? I, I yeah. did. Yes. It, 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 what is there you? is a dot between the two names. It's, it's Benjamin dot Pomerantz. Title at DVA. Deputy Director for Program Development. Very good. Excellent. Thank you. Great. Thanks to all of you. Have a nice night. Thank you, everybody. Stay safe. Take Thank care. you. Sorry, I was late. <laughs>